Right now on Morning News Now, border in the balance. This morning, a federal appeals court weighing a controversial Texas law that allows the arrest and deportation of migrants illegally entering the U.S. We will continue to build those border barriers, uh, keep the buoys in the water, build a Texas border wall, doing everything we can to protect the sovereignty of the state of Texas and the United States of America. We'll bring you the latest on the legal limbo that's sparking a debate from the southern border to the nation's capital. Plus, key witness, a former associate of Rudy Giuliani testifying at the Capitol as part of the impeachment inquiry into President Biden over the business practices of his son, Hunter. More on the hearing and why Lev Parnas is calling the impeachment effort propaganda. Also this morning, promising new findings about colon cancer, what researchers are saying about a kind of bacteria found in many cases that could lead to a more effective form of treatment. And let the madness begin. Put your dancing shoes on and fill out those brackets. The men's NCAA tournament tips off today. We'll have your cheat sheet for the teams to watch from the top seeds to the underdogs and the Cinderella stories that could surprise you. Is your bracket done? Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. I bet it's a winner. You could just guess, and you'll probably yeah, do better yeah, than most people. That's so. true. That's true. Are you excited, though? I'm very excited. Yeah. yeah I've got yeah. my bracket done and ready to go. There so you go. we'll see what happens. Good morning. Good to have you with us. I'm Joe Fryer. And I'm Savannah Sellers. We're going to get started this morning with the latest in Texas. So the battle continues over that controversial immigration law, SB4. Today, the law remains on ice while a federal appeals court decides the case. Yesterday, judges with the Fifth U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals held an hour long hearing at issue Texas. Texas's attempt to arrest and deport people who illegally enter the country. Now, that hearing is part of a legal ping pong game between the Supreme Court and the Federal Appeals Court. The law was initially put on hold by the Supreme Court. Then justices allowed it to take effect, only to see the law blocked again hours later by the Appeals Court. Here's the issue at the center of it all. Texas officials want to take immigration control into their own hands with Senate Bill 4 after seeing a spike in illegal border crossings. It would give state authorities the power to arrest arrest and deport migrants, even though historically overseeing immigration in the border, those have always been under the federal government's control. Now it's a wait and see. The law will remain frozen at least until next month when the Fifth Circuit has scheduled more oral arguments to consider whether the law is constitutional. NBC News correspondent David Noriega is on the border in Eagle Pass, Texas with the latest. So David, both the Justice Department and the Texas Solicitor General made their arguments in front of the judges on the Fifth Circuit yesterday. What did we hear? Yeah, guys, good morning. So what's at issue right now is whether this law will be allowed to go into effect while the constitutional challenge against it works its way through the courts. On the one hand, you have the federal government saying that this law, all of this law, inherently is unconstitutional because it infringes on the federal government's sole authority to enforce immigration law. Texas says that the law, uh, it mirrors existing federal immigration law and doesn't contradict or get in the way of it in any way at all. Uh, you know, th that's what's at issue here is whether the law will be allowed to, to, to be in place even just temporarily while the constitutional challenge moves forward. Yesterday's hearing, I would say the judges were pretty split. So right now, really, it's a coin toss on whether we will actually see people arrested under this law in the weeks or months to come. So one of the major issues here is how Texas would implement this law if it were to go into effect, because the state is already thin on resources, right, to handle this influx of illegal migrant crossings. And then there's questions over how the proposed deportations would even be carried out. Uh, what is being said about that? What did the Texas Solicitor General say specifically on that matter? As far as the, the attorney representing Texas in the hearing yesterday, this is actually one of the things that really jumped out at me the most about the hearing is that the, 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 the attorney was asked on multiple occasions to give specific sort of illustrations of how this law would be uh, carried out, how it would be implemented in concrete terms, and he was not able to. He, he repeatedly admitted that he did not know what this would look like, including in that really, really key provision that you mentioned, the deportations. One of the most unprecedented aspects of this law is that it would give uh, state authorities the power to remove immigrants back to Mexico. It has never been that way before. The federal government has always carried out deportations for a lot of reasons, because deportations require binational agreements, for example, between the United States and the country 
country receiving the migrants. In this case, Mexico came out, Mexican officials, right up to the president, came out very soon after the law was allowed to go into effect uh, for just a few hours, saying that they would absolutely, under no circumstances, receive anybody deported under this law. Th this law, uh, it's uncharted territory in a lot of respects. That question about the deportations is by far the most uncertain. Back to you. David, what is next in this case? I'm guessing when the circuit court does issue its ruling, there's a good chance this will make its way back to the Supreme Court? Yeah, I think it's all but certain that whoever the losing party is at the Fifth Circuit will appeal it up to the Supreme Court. The question is whether the Supreme Court will agree to review it. I think it's likely that it will, given the really high degree of importance and urgency of this case. Uh, you know, the constitutional legal experts that I've consulted on this say that there's pretty strong precedent supporting the federal government's case, including, uh, as you're, you know, probably the most famous case is Arizona's Show Me Your Papers law from back in 2010, where the Supreme Court ruled that Arizona could not pass a law similar to this one because it violated the Constitution. But, you know, we're in a pretty uncertain time now, especially with this, uh, you know, relatively new conservative supermajority on the court. And and I, I don't think that we should be making any clear predictions about where this will land one way or another. Back to you. David Noriega reporting from Texas. David, thank you. And while many big cities are feeling the strain of the growing number of migrants in the U.S., some smaller towns are divided over whether to welcome them as they look to fill thousands of jobs. NBC News Homeland Security correspondent Julia Ainsley has more. In major cities across America, officials say they've reached a breaking point struggling to handle the record number of arriving migrants. But here in small town Fremont, Nebraska, where there are just 39 workers for every 100 job openings, some are encouraging even more legal migrants to come. We need these people. We need this work done. This is what feeds the, feeds the nation and the world. Many of the openings are at this half billion dollar chicken plant opened in 2019. Young locals often move away, leaving those slaughterhouse jobs to migrants like Vicente Hernandez. With Hispanic migrants, although it is hard, although it is heavy, they endure, he says. The difference with an American citizen is that every time he finds a job, when he sees it is hard, he leaves it, he says. Hernandez and his wife are also pastors to the growing Guatemalan community. Once this town of 27,000 was nearly all white. Now one out of six are Latino. Since 2018, the school district added almost 800 non-English speaking students. Meatpacking is the biggest industry here in Fremont. The state's Chamber of Commerce says Nebraska needs to welcome more migrants to fill jobs like these. But some residents here are resistant to that change. Voters backed a town ordinance twice, which says locals must tell the city that they are here legally before they can rent housing. The city cannot always verify the information, but people say the law remains on the books to send a message. Councilman Paul Van Baren supports it. Why was it brought up? Citizens had asked the city council to do something because it was pretty obvious that we were become a haven for illegals. He argues slaughterhouses paying low wages to migrants lowers incomes for citizens and criticizes increased costs for migrant children at local schools. The sheer pressure of bringing in numbers of people has resulted in a considerable burden to the taxpayers. But City Councilman Mark Jensen, who's lived in the area since he was 10 years old, is against that ordinance. It's a bad look for our city. And he says Fremont needs to embrace change. Immigration is crucial. A lot of people that live and grew up here don't stay. They, they, they move out. It's critical for us to... Uh, to have the, the people that we've got here. Back at the church, Vicente tells us he regularly gets about three hours of sleep a night. But still, he and his wife Maria say they found their new hometown. Now I live the American dream, as they call it. I'm happy because I have everything, she tells us. State officials say they often have problems with undocumented workers using fake IDs. Just this month, four migrants were charged with using them to get slaughterhouse jobs. Julia Ainsley, thank you. Lev Parnas, a former associate of Rudy Giuliani, came out swinging yesterday during a hearing on Capitol Hill, part of the Biden impeachment inquiry. He gave statements that the allegations against the Biden family are false. After testifying before the House Oversight Committee, Parnas told NBC News that the hearings are pushing Russian propaganda. NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Ryan Nobles has more. A fiery inflection point in the impeachment inquiry into President Joe Biden. Excuse me, sir. Excuse me, sir. This is Mr. Bobulinski. This is my time. 
conference. House Republicans holding a hearing designed to feature Hunter Biden, who had asked to give public testimony, but declined to appear. Instead, the committee heard from a pair of former Hunter Biden business associates who testified despite President Biden's denials, he was involved in his son's businesses. He was an active, aware enabler who met with business associates such as myself to further the business. They say Joe Biden participated in person and on speakerphone in meetings and dinners with Hunter's foreign business partners. Hunter's former business associate, Jason Galanis, testifying from prison. The vice president said hello, some pleasantries, and then hope you had safe travels. And then said, quote, OK, be, you be good to my boy. But Democrats firing back, saying there was no evidence of a crime. With any luck, today marks the end of perhaps the most spectacular failure in the history of congressional investigations. The effort to find a high crime or misdemeanor committed by Joe Biden and then to impeach him for it. Democrats invited Lev Parnas, a one-time associate of former President Trump's attorney, Rudy Giuliani, who testified that he was tasked with digging up dirt on Biden business ventures in Ukraine. I found precisely zero evidence of the Biden's corruption in Ukraine. In an exclusive interview, Parnas accused Republicans of being willing accomplices of the Kremlin. They're not getting down to the truth. All they're doing is pushing the same Russian narrative and propaganda. And tonight, the Oversight Committee Chairman James Comer saying he will invite President Biden to testify at an upcoming hearing. Our thanks to Ryan Noble for that report. We'll hear for more on this is NBC News legal analyst Danny Savalos. Danny, good morning. So how significant is this to have Lev Parnas come out and speak against former President Trump and Rudy Giuliani in this way? It's significant, but there's going to be something for everybody with Lev Parnas's testimony because he's a kind of cooperator with the same baggage that you might see in, say, a Michael Cohen, somebody who was very loyal to people like Giuliani in the case of Lev Parnas and uh, now has totally turned against him. And whenever you have someone like that with a cooperator type character, uh, you can make the point that, well, they were so sure of what they were telling you before, and now they're saying, oh, I've seen the light. You know, were you lying then or are you lying now? But all in all, the Lev Parnas testimony was a big dud for Republicans. It didn't deliver what they wanted, which was evidence of criminality. Some of the other witnesses uh, may be a little more successful for the Republicans, but Lev Parnas was uh, not a success. So during his testimony, Parnas continued to say there was no evidence of corruption from the Biden family involving Ukraine. How much longer does it seem Republicans can try to push for an impeachment with such little evidence, especially when a key witness is charged with lying? Yeah, that's definitely a, uh, a solid political question there about how long they can do it. I mean, Republicans would do it for as long as they could until they uncover damaging information. And then, of course, remember, you say that Lev Parnas says, well, you know, there was no there was no support for the information that was provided. Lev Parnas provided some of that information. So he's essentially impeaching his own credibility. But look, when it comes to cooperators, what I've found uh, is that there you have situations where people were in the cult, you know, the figurative cult, so to speak, and they were brainwashed and they, they bought into it. And then now they see the light. And you know what? Uh, just as an, a, a comparison, juries believe that they understand it. They get it. Uh, they're willing to forgive that somebody may have turned changed sides and now sees the error of their ways. So uh, for that reason, I would say that ultimately the net effect of Parnas's uh, testimony was that he was credible and credible in a way that benefited the Democrats. So, Danny, Hunter Biden himself declined to testify, but now that two of his former business partners have testified in Congress, what's next here for Hunter? Boy, you know, Abby Lowell has kept us guessing, and that's Hunter Biden's attorney, who I think has done really a remarkable job, a creative job in playing defense attorney, because we defense attorneys are incredibly biased towards risk aversion. And Abby Lowell, you see him right there to the left of uh, Hunter Biden. We attorneys are always just to the left with half our face cut off. Uh, there he is again, half cut off. And, uh, you know, the lawyer, Hunter Biden's lawyer, Abby Lowell here, has really done a good job of protecting Hunter Biden, but also trying some creative ideas like offering him for uh, to possibly testify, then maybe not offering him to testify. What we've learned about uh, 
testimony in both the, in Congress is that it's not like an ordinary subpoena. You can use leverage uh, to testify, to not testify. Uh, you can make out arrangements. You can negotiate in a way you simply can't in the criminal justice system or even the civil system. So uh, this is, you know, this is all very strategic by Hunter Biden's team. And so far, they've done a pretty good job. Danny Savalos, thank you so much. No, we show all of Danny's. I know. <laughs> Some of the country will see <laughs> snow and rain today, and the wet stuff's moving east for the weekend. Let's get a check on your morning news now. Weather. Angie Lastman is here in studio tracking it all. Hi, Angie. Good morning. Hi, good morning, guys. We've got a whole lot to talk about over the next couple of days when it comes to impactful weather. Let's start with what we're dealing with right now. A little bit of snow working across parts of the northern plains and the upper Midwest. We've also got some snow working out of parts of New England, but more rounds of snow to come. And we've got plenty of winter alerts, 15 million people included in those here uh, through the next couple of days. This isn't just a today kind of a situation that we're going to be watching. We've got two sections that we're, we're keeping an eye on. One part of a system that's bringing the snow that you just saw to parts of the plains. That'll ramp up as the days go on. We've also got an area of low pressure that's going to kind of develop and then lift plenty of moisture into parts of the south. Today it's stretching from Texas into Oklahoma and out towards the Gulf Coast. By tomorrow, much of this works into the southeast. We're talking drenching rain across portions of Florida and points north of that into the Carolinas. We've got some rain across parts of the Ohio Valley, and we've got some snow to deal with uh, across parts of the Great Lakes. As we get into your Saturday, unfortunately, it looks like we could see some soggy conditions for any outdoor plans you might have for Saturday up and down the East Coast, and parts of the northern uh, New England area are going to see some really heavy and wet snow. We'll see some good amounts of snow at that, and notice how much uh, that heavy rain is kind of hugging the coastal areas. We're also going to watch for a potential for some of these stronger storms to develop. Not a whole lot of people included in this, but we've got uh, major cities like Houston that are going to see the potential for this later today. Looks like the biggest threat will be hail, but we could see maybe some gusty winds and even a couple of tornadoes through tonight. Uh, Rain-wise, I'm a little concerned about the flooding conditions across portions of South Florida. It doesn't take much for us to see uh, flooded streets there, impassable roads there. And we could see upwards of five to even six inches of rain in some of those isolated spots, especially south of Alligator Alley. You look along the Carolinas, heavy rain expected there, too, two to three inches by the time we get into the weekend. Again, with those isolated amounts, places like Atlantic City, New York, Boston, not out of the question for us to see up to four inches of rain. When it comes to the snow, parts of the upper Midwest, like the Dakotas, Montana, could see maybe six to nine inches. I think the more widespread numbers that you'll see, Minneapolis, Green Bay, parts of uh, Michigan and Illinois, maybe three inches or so. Uh, northern New England, though, uh, potentially a foot of snow by the time we get into Saturday. This will be something that we watch through Saturday. It'll start to ramp up by Sunday. Elsewhere, for your Friday forecast, we've got plenty of sunshine middle of the country. It's unsettled. I just showed you across the east for the next couple of days. More sunshine for the middle of the country by the time we get into Saturday, but we'll start to see another system working into parts of the northwest and the, in the northern plains by the time Saturday rolls around. That starts to move a, a little farther to the east. The east, though, meanwhile, on Sunday, there's what you want for your forecast. <laughs> At least you get one day of it. We've got some spring highs expected and uh, plenty of sunshine to kind of dry out after a very soggy Saturday. We'll take the one day. My there you parents go. just arrived from San Diego for a rude awakening. <laughs> oh, is that sure FYI? It feels like 17, guys, when I got up this morning. Hey, so warm that's welcome. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thanks, Angie. Of course. Well, attorneys for former President Trump have asked a judge to pause lawsuits in several civil cases seeking to hold the former president liable for damages related to the January 6th attack on the Capitol. This comes as the Supreme Court is set to hear oral arguments next month on Mr. Trump's claims of absolute immunity. He's accused of attempting to overturn the 2020 election results, which led to the events of January 6th. The high court's ruling will determine whether the election interference case brought by special counsel Jack Smith can move forward to trial. NBC's Garrett Haig joins us now from Washington with the latest developments. Garrett, good morning. So walk us through this motion filed by Trump's attorneys. What happens if his request for a stay is granted by the judge? Yeah, it's pretty straightforward here. What they're doing is essentially holding up this uh, oral arguments that they're going to have before the Supreme Court in late April as a shield against any other January 6th related cases, arguing that if the Supreme Court says Donald Trump is immune from criminal prosecution because of presidential immunity, that would change how their argument would play out in these civil cases. I'm not a lawyer. I sometimes play one on TV. But it seems like the kind of thing that a judge might look at at least as a, as a cause for delay here on cases that obviously were now set 
several years into anyway. So uh, we'll see what this judge in the civil case says. And of course, we'll be waiting probably till fairly late in the summer to hear what the Supreme Court's going to do on this immunity question. Mm -hmm. Garrett, let's go to Georgia, the election interference case there. The judge presiding over the case is giving Mr. Trump and eight of his co-defendants permission to appeal that order the judge made that allows DA Fonnie Willis to remain on the case. Of course, Nathan Wade had to resign from the case. What's the significance of this decision by the judge? How could it impact a case that's already moving pretty slowly? Well, the Trump uh, attorneys down in Georgia think it could be very significant. They still think there's a possibility on appeal that Falfani Willis could get thrown off this case, based at least in part on the scathing decision issued by the judge who allowed her to stay on it, but questioned her ethics and the way in which this trial would move forward. But even if they're not able to get her kicked off the case, this is once again an opportunity to delay that trial moving forward. And delay has been the order of the day for Donald Trump on all of these cases, really, since the jump. Garrett, I want to ask you about another piece of news from the former president. This was in a recent radio interview. Uh, he, former president seemed to suggest you would be open to supporting a national ban on abortion after 15 weeks of pregnancy. Tell us about what he said. Yeah, Savannah, during the course of his political career, Donald Trump has taken basically every conceivable position on the issue of abortion, and he's long resisted uh, as a Republican and as a Republican presidential candidate being pinned down on any kind of specific ban. In the past, he said this is the kind of thing that should be negotiated and that he would be well suited to negotiate it. But there's been a lot of discussion in his orbit about the idea of a 15 week national ban. Uh, the former president said he floated that number. He says he thinks there's a lot of agreement around that number. Uh, agreement among who, I think, is a fair question to ask there. Uh, but he does seem to be inching closer to taking a more concrete policy position on this, something that Democrats in the Biden campaign, by the way, are basically licking their chops about. They think this is a very potent issue for them and that any kind of national ban proposed by the Republican nominee here would be the kind of thing that would really rally uh, Democrats to President Biden's cause. All right, Garrett Haig, thank you so much. You In a bid to fight man-made climate change, the White House announced new automobile standards aimed at cutting carbon emissions. The new rules relax tailpipe limits that were proposed last year. Eventually, the standards would get tougher over time to help reach the goals set out last year, like having more than 55 percent of car sales be electric by 2032. This new plan from the Biden administration comes as sales of electric vehicles are starting to slow down. The EPA says the new standards will prevent more than 7 billion tons tons of planet warming carbon emissions over the next three decades. President Biden is looking to slash carbon dioxide emissions from gasoline powered vehicles, which make up the largest single source of greenhouse gas emissions in the U.S. Well, guess what? It is finally time for March Madness. The college basketball tournament gets going today with matchups in the first round of the men's tournament. The good news right now, your bracket is perfect. By day's end, it probably <laughs> won't be. No matter, the top teams in the nation are starting their journey toward a national championship. A six-game winning streak is all it takes to cut down those nets. Here to get us ready for the start of March Madness is USA Today national sports columnist Dan Wilkin. Dan, thanks for joining us. So first, just what are the top matchups that you're keeping an eye on? Well, you get that first round of the tournament. There's always those interesting 5-12, 6-11, where the upsets tend to be, even the 4-13 games. I've got my eye on a couple today, Gonzaga versus McNeese State. McNeese State, a team led by Will Wade, former LSU coach, was fired in a scandal, goes down to McNeese State. He's got a team that's won 31 games this year. Interesting matchup for Gonzaga. Kansas is really injured right now. Uh, they're playing Samford, a team that really likes to get up and down the court. They press, they run. That's going to be fascinating. And then tomorrow, Texas A&M, Nebraska, great classic 8-9 game, very even teams. And then James Madison, really good team out of Virginia, 31-3 and this year, playing Wisconsin uh, from the Big Ten, who got to the final of the Big Ten tournament last week. So I think some really good first-round matchups coming. I put all 15 seeds. I'm just kidding. I did not do that at all. All right. So the madness has already begun even before the tournament started. Just a few years after winning the D1 title, Virginia already making an early exit, losing their play-in game. Tell us what we saw there. And what does this tell us about the intensity and the magic of March Madness? Well, yeah, if you even go back before Virginia won the national title, the year before that, if you remember, they were the first number one seed to ever lose to a number 16, UMBC. Terrible disappointment, historic loss. They come back the next year, win the title, play a bunch of close games. And ever since then, actually, Tony Bennett has not won a game 
in the NCAA tournament. College basketball, college sports have changed a lot since 2019 uh, with all the transfers, the name, image, and likeness, the ability to make money uh, doing ads and things like that. So, you know, Virginia is one of those programs. Have they really adapted quickly enough to this new world? Uh, their style of play, very slow and plotting. They don't score a lot of points. Uh, yeah, a little bit of a question mark right now about what the future is. Tony Bennett, great coach, had an unbelievable run at Virginia. But does he need to change some things to get that program back to the top of the sport? For anyone who is putting a last-minute bracket together, who do you see going far this year? Who, who should we put? Who's Elite Eight? Who's Final Four? What do you think? Well, I'll tell you what. Right now, I think UConn is the team that uh, – has got to be favored to win back-to-back -back national titles. I mean, they've just been plowing through everybody. They've got the best offense in, in college basketball. Um, you know, Houston on the other side of the bracket, they're the number one seed in the South. They've got the best defense out there, and, and they're just fantastic. Uh, they make the game really ugly, physical, hard to score. And then I, I think one of the big question marks here is Purdue. You know, Purdue, Zach Eady, National Player of the Year, probably for a second year in a row, you know, seven foot four, uh, incredible <laughs> height and uh, proficiency around the basket. But they lost last year in the first round as a number one seed. Uh, and so that's on their shoulders. How do they break through? They've had a couple March Madness disappointments. I think there's a ton of pressure on Purdue this year to cash in their last year with Zach Eady. Are they going to go all the way? Let's, of course, talk about the women's tournament, which begins tomorrow. Caitlin Clark in Iowa don't play until mm -hmm. Saturday. She has never won an NCAA title, but it's not going to be easy to do it again this year. What are you looking forward to most on the women's side? Yeah, obviously, Caitlin Clark, the season she's had, the career she's had, and drawing in casual fans to women's college basketball, really changing the face of the sport. I think the women's tournament is going to draw tremendous interest and in, in television viewers this year because of Caitlin Clark and some other storylines, including LSU. You know, LSU beat Iowa last year in the championship game, won it all under Kim Mulkey. Uh, it was a bit of a surprise run and and really made a star out of, out of Angel Reese and uh, Flaugier Johnson. So LSU is a really great team. And guess what? They're going to have to play Iowa potentially in the elite eight. Only one of those two teams is going to go to the final four this year. And then you've also got South Carolina who is undefeated trying to win a national championship. Don Staley, their coach has won, won it twice, uh, has not gone undefeated, which they came up short last year. Iowa beat them in the final four. So if South Carolina can get there, if Iowa can get there, Really, really intense, great just personalities and storylines in the women's draw. So exciting. Dan Mulkin, thank you so much. Thank you. Much more to come here on Morning News Now. Later this hour, a new clue that could help doctors understand and treat colon cancer. What we're learning about a type of drug-resistant bacteria discovered in many patients. Up first, though, after the break, staying the course. The Fed announcing it won't raise interest rates despite concerns, but they're not dropping them either. More on the decision and what it means for your bottom line. Next, we will be right back. We're back now with economic news. As expected, the Federal Reserve is holding steady on interest rates. Yeah, the Fed previously projected there would be three rate cuts by the end of the year. But for now, they are keeping those rates at about 5.5% as we continue to fight inflation. Here to help us explain what it means, Investopedia Editor-in-Chief Caleb Silver. Good to have you with us. So uh, not a surprise. This is about what we expect to talk more about this. Yeah, no surprises, but a really dovish tone. We talk about Federal Reserve Banks as either dovish or hawkish. Hawkish meaning their tightening policy, dovish meaning their loosening policy. They are signifying three rate cuts as expected. They're not terribly concerned about this recent spike in inflation. And the Fed says economic growth is strong. They're projecting 2.1 percent growth GDP for 2024. It was a lot lower last year. So the economy is in decent shape and the Fed still signaling that it is going to cut rates. That set the stock market into a rally and is going to loosen monetary policy around all the things we borrow from. We did hear, though, from Fed Chair about this inflation sort of situation we seem to be stuck in, right? I mean, it's dropped from its peak, but then it feels like it's kind of stubborn to actually get down to that 2% they're looking for. What did we learn in his comments about inflation and what he's going to do? That that 2% might not be the line anymore. They might just be used to the fact, and we should get used to the fact, that inflation is going to be here, somewhere between 25 and 3.5%. Food costs have gone up 20% in the last three years. Yeah. Insurance costs have gone up like 30%. So these costs are going to stick here. We're not going to have 
deflation, a drop in prices. But if the economy can grow at this rate, the Fed is comfortable with that. And that's pretty good news for the economy and for people that are either borrowing money or intend to borrow money or have money in the bank. So with interest rates staying put, what does that mean for the average person and the price we're paying? for? Yeah. They're staying put now, but they're going to go down later this year. So you're going to see mortgage rates fall. We've already seen a crack in the housing market. You're going to see credit card APRs fall. So if you're borrowing at a really high APR on your credit card, you're going to probably have an opportunity to lower that rate with a lower uh, interest card going forward. But for people that have money in the bank, and a lot of people have put money in the bank over the last couple of years, because as interest rates are high, you get more from a CD or a high yield savings account. Those numbers are going to fall. The yield on those products are going to fall. So if you want to trap in a good paying CD right now or a high yield savings account, it's a good time because you're not going to see as attractive rates towards the end of the year. So even though right now we're not seeing those rates come down, we're still seeing inflation kind of stuck. There are these good news markers too, right? Like the job market's strong, stock market's up. Explain just how delicate this balance is, like this tightrope that the Fed has to walk to make sure we don't play it too safe or we don't do anything too dramatic to keep people in a good enough place. And that is the Fed's job, right? Keep us in that tightrope, not too far with monetary policy, too tight that you can't borrow or too loose that people are borrowing too much like we did in the great financial crisis. And then engineering what we call a soft landing. If they can keep unemployment below 4 percent and the economy growing right now, that is good news for companies, good news for workers because they're getting rate wage increases right now. The economy's in a decent spot and the Fed is signaling it's going to be okay through the rest of the year. Mm. All right. Caleb Silver, thank you so much. Appreciate Great it. Great to have you in studio. Well, just as the Major League Baseball season is getting underway, there are blockbuster allegations involving one of the game's biggest stars. The Los Angeles Dodgers have fired the longtime interpreter for their newly signed player, Shohei Otani. The Dodgers fired Ipe Mitsuhara after questions arose surrounding an ESPN report that at least $4.5 million in wire transfers were allegedly sent from Otani's bank account to an illegal bookmaker. Now, ESPN reports that Mitsuhara incurred the gambling debts to a Southern California bookmaking operation that's under federal investigation. Sports betting in California is illegal. In an interview on Tuesday with ESPN, Mitsuhara says that he asked Otani last year to pay off his gambling debt, and Otani agreed. He says Otani had no involvement in betting. But on Wednesday, Mitsuhara told ESPN Otani had no knowledge of his gambling debts and that Otani had not transferred money to the bookmaker. Otani's lawyer said in a statement that the player was the victim of a, quote, massive theft. The Dodgers confirmed the firing but are not commenting on the investigation. NBC News has reached out to Mitsuhara and Otani's reps seeking further comment overnight. But so far, we have not heard back. Let's get you some international news now, starting with a potential deal for WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange. NBC News international correspondent Josh Letterman joins us with that and other world news. Josh, good morning. Hey, good morning. WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange could potentially avoid extradition to the U.S. on espionage charges under a potential deal with the Justice Department. The Wall Street Journal reports the Justice Department may let him plead guilty instead to a reduced charge of mishandling classified information. But Assange's legal team tells NBC News they see no indication the U.S. is calling off its campaign to extradite him on those charges, which stem from publishing U.S. classified documents more than a decade ago. Let's head over to Vietnam, where President Vo Van Thuong has just resigned after only about a year in office. He is the latest top political official in Vietnam to leave amid allegations of corruption, with Vietnam's Communist Party accusing him of violations it says stained the party's reputation. Those resignations are raising questions about Vietnam's political stability and whether it's safe for foreign businesses to invest there. And back here in London, a new mural by mysterious street artist Banksy has been defaced. The mural of a tree on a residential building in North London's Finsbury Park was partly covered up with white paint only two days after it appeared. Now, the local government had actually embraced the graffiti artwork and has now put up a fence around the mural to protect it. Joe and Savannah. All right, new developments there. Josh, thank you so much. Coming up, a medical breakthrough that could help save lives. Researchers have discovered a drug-resistant bacteria while studying colon cancer. So when we come back, more on what they found and how it could lead to better forms of treatment. Stay with us. This is Morning News Now.
are back with the results of a new study that could provide insight into the spread and treatment of colorectal cancer. Research published in the Nature Journal found that a new type of bacteria thought to be found in the mouth may be behind a treatment-resistant form of colon cancer. That strain was found in 50% of the samples used in the study. NBC News medical fellow Dr. Akshay Sayal joins us for more. Dr. Sayal, great to have you with us again today. So tell us, what do we know about this bacteria and how is it potentially able to shield colon tumors? from cancer-fighting drugs. Right, so this bacteria, guys, is called Fusobacterium, and there's been interest in this for the last decade or so. Is, is, you know, it's been associated with worse outcomes in colorectal cancer. It's even been associated with the spread of colon cancer, mm. meaning metastatic disease. Um, and so what they're trying to you know, figure out in this paper was that if, if we look back at, at patients who have colon cancer and we find this bacteria, um, is there anything specific we can garner? Can we get really granular here and figure out, is there something in this bacteria that's driving the cases and acting like that cloak, like you mentioned? And what they found was that, Savannah, 50 percent of cases were associated with a really specific type of this bacteria wow. that could potentially p uh, pave the way for treatments for this one day. How advanced was the colon cancer in those where they found the high levels of bacteria? So mm. in this study, Joe, they didn't really look at, at that question, but what they did find in, the, in past studies is that you know people who do have this, they are associated with worse survival. Um, and anytime you have things like that open up new pathways for this, you think, if I address that bacteria, could I improve that worse survival and could I possibly make for, for better treatments in the future? Something that we've been talking about lately that's really important, and I'm so happy that we're getting the word out there, is that this is on the rise in younger and younger yeah. people. Uh, people often much younger than they would even recommend a colonoscopy for, for example. Did this shed any light on that, this study? It, it could, Savannah, one day. And, and you know, the, the young question, or the, the question about young people and colon cancer is the hottest topic in research right now, and we're always looking for ways to, to add to that. And, you know, what the hope is, if, if in future trials, now that we know this question about this bacteria being present in higher levels, could we swap young people for this in the future and see, is it something mm. that they're, they're having, you know, from an early age? Is that what's driving the disease in these young people? But, guys, we just don't know yet. Yeah, I guess what's the dream looking down the road? How could this possibly help right. with how we screen mm -hmm. or even possibly how we treat colon cancer? Yes, yeah, two things, Joe. So I think the first one is a, is a mouth swab. So this bacteria is something that's found in our mouths. It is something that drives plaque. Um, so go to your dentist. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but this, you know, if you swab for this one day and you start to see that down the line this is causing that disease, you could potentially give an antibiotic, right? Something that wipes out that bacteria and something that could, uh, you know, once treated, lead to better outcomes and even okay. stop the, the development of cancer uh, in the first place. Wow. Dr. Akshay Sal, important information. Thank you very much for coming Thanks. by. Coming up, President Biden turning to tech to try and help boost the economy. Yeah, when we come back, the billion dollar plan the president just announced that could help create thousands of jobs. This is Morning News Now. We're back with more on a big tech announcement President Biden made during his re-election campaign stop yesterday in the battleground state of Arizona. Billions of dollars in tech grants and loans are going to computer chip maker Intel to boost production in the United States. It's all thanks to the CHIPS Act, not to be confused with your favorite snack. This latest tech push could also mean thousands of new jobs. NBC News senior business correspondent Christine Romans has more. President Biden in the critical swing county of Maricopa, Arizona, with a multi-billion dollar delivery. We will enable advanced semiconductor manufacturing to make a comeback here in America after 40 years. Mr. Biden announcing eight and a half billion dollars in grants and 11 billion more in loans to semiconductor manufacturer Intel. Money from the Bipartisan Chips Act passed in 2022. The money going toward the construction and expansion of Intel facilities in Arizona, Ohio, New Mexico, and Oregon. Combined, it will create nearly 20,000, 20,000 construction jobs. Here in Chandler, Arizona, 6,000 construction workers are building two chip plants known as FABs, projected to host 3,000 manufacturing jobs. Intel CEO Pat Gelsinger says the government investment is essential to competing with China. It isn't just a question of our national security, it's every aspect of our economy as well. And these are great jobs. The owner of Chandler restaurant Gadzooks, Aaron Poole, welcomes the investment and the foot traffic it could mean after years of people working from home. In a fab shop, you actually have to go in to work. And he hopes out for lunch. Poole says business owners like him are in a paradox. Well, now we're at a point where you can't raise prices anymore. Consumer won't allow it. But he says he has no choice but to raise wages. 
19-year-old cashier, Talia Palahalani, brings home $1,300 every two weeks. It's good that you get paid more, I guess, but then at the end of the day, it's like everything's so expensive. It's like you're not really getting much out of it. Affordability top of mind here in Maricopa County. Over the past four years, home prices up 53%. Rents have surged 37 percent. People left to figure out how to make it all add up. We said people are paid more, but everything costs more. Right. And we just have to do more with less. With so many struggling with high housing costs and lingering inflation, President Biden has low approval ratings on his handling of the economy. One of the reasons why he's highlighting bills like the Bipartisan Chips Act as he seeks a second term. All right, Christine Romans, thank you. Let's get to some financial headlines now. So those pesky data brokers will no longer be able to send your info to foreign countries. CNBC Savannah now joins us with that and other money news. Savannah, good morning. Joe Savannah, good morning. That's right. So the House has passed a bill to ban data brokers from selling Americans personal information to foreign adversaries, countries like China, Russia, North Korea, and Iran. Now, those data brokers could face penalties from the Federal Trade Commission if they're found to have sold sensitive information, such as a person's location or health data. Lawmakers hope this measure, along with the bill passed last week that could ultimately ban TikTok here in the U.S., will protect Internet users and national security. Paramount has a new bidder. Private equity firm Apollo Global has reportedly offered $11 billion to buy the company's film studio, Paramount Pictures. Now, it's considered the crown jewel with a huge movie library that includes classics such as The Godfather and Breakfast at Tiffany's and blockbuster franchises like Mission Impossible. Sherry Redstone, who controls Paramount Global through her stake in its parent company, has reportedly been reluctant to part with the studio. She's instead working on a rival deal with Skydance Media, which is run by billionaire David Ellison. And Subway is bringing its sandwich sauces to your neighborhood grocery store. The chain is selling four different sauces at Walmart, Kroger, Albertsons, and several other outlets. Subway is working with T. Marzetti on the effort. The sauce is sweet onion teriyaki, Baja Chipotle, roasted garlic aioli, and creamy Italian MVP will be available in 16-ounce bottles starting next week. Mm. I'm surprised it hadn't Get happened already. All right, there you go. I love a Subway sandwich, so <laughs> that's kind of cool. <laughs> Thank you, Savannah. Thanks. Let's yeah. turn now to Ohio, where one man is facing charges for allegedly making numerous calls to local police and an elementary school. Well, his main complaint, that his son has too much homework. NBC News correspondent Shaq Brewster has the details. Scott, you got to up for you. This Ohio dad, Adam Sizemore, arrested after police say he repeatedly called his child's elementary school and then the police station making profanity-laced demands. We're talking about homework here. This gentleman was mad that his son was getting homework. Officer, police department. Yeah, who am I talking to? Sizemore harassing the station's operator, calling more than 18 times in just an hour, according to police. What do you need help with? I need to talk to the chief. Okay, well then I will transfer you to his office. No, no. Eventually leaving voicemails like this one. Yeah, this is Adam Sizemore. You've got a little bit of an chewing coming. He had been calling Oxford, Ohio's kindergarten through fifth grade Kramer Elementary School repeatedly as well, according to a police report filed by the school's resource officer who told police Sizemore's crude language and messages targeted the principal and staff. So it's not like uh, we're talking about large book reports or anything here, but he just did not want his child to have any homework so that he could have more time to spend with his son. Police say they started getting concerned when Sizemore allegedly admitted on the calls that he was high and made vague threats toward the principal. His behavior became a little bit more aggressive. You know, the, the school, the children, you want to make sure everybody's safe. At the station, Sizemore demanding to speak with the chief again. But I'm not calling him on the phone. He's him up in the house. I pay for him. Finally, pushing the operator a step too far. Sir, police department. Yeah, ma'am, I'd like to talk to the chief. Okay, and I have transferred you up there, so you need to leave him a voicemail. I'm not going to leave a voicemail. Okay, voice well, I'm going to send some officers out to your house to talk to you in person since you won't stop calling. Police saying he was charged with two counts of telecommunications harassment and one count of menacing. 
all misdemeanors that can carry jail time and fines if he's found guilty. Sizemore telling NBC News that most of the accusations are not true. A spokesperson for the Talawanda School District, where Kramer Elementary School is located, saying they have no additional information beyond what's in the police report. What did the chief think of this? He filled out the chief's voice mailbox, let's just put it that way. So uh, uh, the chief was kind of confused. He, he doesn't have a whole lot to do with homework. So. You're looking at right now, it's successful. Our thanks to Shaq Brewster for that report. While Adam Sizemore is out of jail and is awaiting trial, if found guilty, those misdemeanor charges could add up to about a year of jail time and or about $2,000 in fines. Well, coming up, a new leash on life for animals once used for lab testing. Up next, we're going to talk to a woman who turned a testing site into a sanctuary for dogs that may have otherwise been euthanized. Don't pause your devices. This is Morning News Now. Welcome back. Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice, be just kidding. All right, Warner Brothers just released a handful of first look images from Tim Burton's long awaited Beetlejuice sequel. Believe it or not, it's been more than three decades since the quirky demon played by Michael Keaton first stole our hearts, maybe freaked some of us out too. From the pictures, it looks like he is not done causing more than a little mischief. In the first photo, you can see Keaton back at it in that iconic jail-striped suit. In another, we see the return of Winona Ryder and Catherine O'Hara, plus some new additions to the freaky franchise like Jenna Ortega and Justin Thoreau. The new film is appropriately called Beetlejuice. Beetlejuice, it is due out this September, but be careful not to say his name three times, unless, of course, you're feeling brave, although I guess if they make a third movie, yeah. they'll have no choice. Are they right? going to title it that? I know. I love Beetlejuice, so I'm so excited about that. Thank you, Joe. Finally, this morning, we have got an incredible story for you about an organization saving animals. Thanks to the Beetle Beagle Freedom Project, lab testing animals from across the country are getting a new lease on life. Unfortunately, in most cases, these animals do not usually have a happy ending after they're no longer needed for research. And of course, they often live through, at the very least, discomfort while being tested on. Well, Shannon Keith is working to give those animals the best life possible at a new rehab sanctuary in Oklahoma, and she joins us now. Shannon, good morning. Thank you so much for being here. So you are the founder of the Beagle Freedom Project, and I am just, I'm so in love with this story. First, just give us some background information on what it is that these animals go through when they're tested on, and then the state that you ultimately find them in as you're rescuing them. Sure, and thank you so much for having me and telling this uh, amazing story. Um, <clears throat> so most people don't know that animals just like your dogs and cats who you spend your life with and who are members of the family are tested on all over the United States and in your backyard in probably every single state. And they go through horrible testing for cosmetics, for pharmaceuticals, for medical devices, and just sometimes for scientific curiosity. Uh, these animals who you're seeing on your screen right now, they were tested on for um, toxic chemicals, for flea and tick testing. Um, many of them live outside 24 seven, which means that they live outside in the elements. Um, sometimes they're brought inside and they're tested on um, inside where fleas and ticks are bred on them in extreme discomfort. And that is not required by law. So that doesn't have to happen. And there are amazing alternatives and that are very safe for animals and safe for people and the environment. And Shannon, um, I understand that, if I may, that for years you've been writing to these testing facilities, right, asking to rescue these animals. And then you finally end up hearing back from someone. Tell me about that response and then what unfolded from there. Right. So we've been writing to facilities every year, and we finally heard back from this facility, which is in in Nevada, Oklahoma. The owner of this facility finally responded to us and said, um, OK, you know, we will work with you. We will release animals to you. This was back in 2021. Um, he actually received a citation from the USDA because of the condition of the animals. And so we started working with his facility in getting uh, the animals out that were no longer needed. Um, and then finally, I just said to him, hey, listen, um, I have a proposition for you. Why don't you relinquish your license? I can see that there is a drop in interest with the toxicity testing. Um, we will purchase the property. We will not purchase your business. Relinquish the license. We'll buy the property. Let's call it a day. <laughs> Mm. And um, after a few months of negotiations, it finally actually happened to my surprise. <laughs> and that <laughs> and is where excited. you now have 
freedom feels. I mean, I just think it's so beautiful. Somebody that you clearly really disagree with when it comes to something like that, you were able to work with and do something that saved these lives. We have less than a minute, but could you just tell us a little bit about what the animals do receive there now? I know they're getting orthopedic beds and all types of nice things before they find a forever home. Yeah, we are turning this 30-acre facility into an amazing rehabilitation education center. We're building areas for the seniors who are who were born there, who are now like 10, 11, 12 years old, who have arthritis, um, a nursery because there are a lot of pregnant dogs. They were breeding there, um, a beautiful place for the cats, a catio they've never seen outside. Oh. Uh, we have a lot to do. We've been, we need a lot of volunteers. So please contact us at Beagle Freedom Project. <laughs> a catio. Shannon Keith, what you're doing is just incredible. And again, I mean, what a story to turn an animal testing facility site into an actual rehab center, a sanctuary for these animals and find them forever homes, by the way, in the process. Shannon, thank you for what you're doing. And thank you very much for joining us this morning. Thank you so much. Those are some happy looking puppies right oh, there. That's going right. to. <laughs> what, a, what a new lease on life, right? No kidding, oh, exactly. I love the story so much. Good for her. All right. That is going to do it for this hour morning news now. Stay with us, though. The news continues right now. Good morning. Thanks for joining us this Thursday. I'm Savannah Sellers. I'm Joe Pryor. Right now on Morning News Now, pressing pause on a controversial Texas law that would drastically change the Lone Star State's immigration landscape. The contentious legal back and forth, it's now putting a Supreme Court decision on hold. We're also following a major shakeup in the world of baseball. The interpreter for Dodgers phenom Shohei Otani fire just as the MLB season is getting underway. The alleged gambling debt scandal that's landing the slugger back in the national spotlight. Also this morning, the stage is set for the big dance. March Madness will tip off in just a few hours, so get those brackets filled out. Will UConn's Huskies return to their championship throne? Or will we witness a Cinderella story for the ages? Only time will tell. And we're going to end this hour with your front row seat the magic of Broadway. We are celebrating 10 years of Aladdin with the genie himself, Michael James Scott. They celebrated 10 years last night. That is a show that has brought so many young people and introduced them to Broadway. That is true. One I've actually seen. There you go. I See, know. There we go. Yes, and I, absolutely <laughs> fantastic. I mean, of course, if you love the movie, what uh, amazing to watch it come to life. How could you not love it on yeah. Broadway? All right, we're going to begin with the ongoing battle over that controversial Texas immigration law, which would give local authorities the power to arrest and deport migrants who enter the country illegally. Yeah, it's been a chaotic 48 hours, really. The Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals held an hour-long hearing yesterday after hitting pause on the law so they can take a closer look at the case. NBC News correspondent Morgan Chesky is on the border in Eagle Pass, Texas with the latest. Yeah, good morning. And right now the debate very much rages on. That three-judge panel heard oral arguments yesterday but has yet to make a ruling. In the meantime, Texas leaders are definitely doubling down. Texas Governor Greg Abbott calling the crisis here at the southern border a catastrophe as the Biden administration stresses that when it comes to enforcing immigration law, it is not a state but a federal responsibility. This morning on the Texas border, both sides digging in over a controversial state law now on hold that would give unprecedented powers to local and state authorities. Texas has a right to defend ourselves, and we will use that authority to declare an invasion and fight back against that invasion. The measure known as SB4 is under review by the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals following a legal whiplash after the Supreme Court allowed it to go into effect for mere hours before being paused yet again. The three-judge panel hearing arguments Wednesday, appearing skeptical of the law. So what if someone enters in, let's say, from Mexico into Arizona and lives there for five years, then moves to Texas? Are they covered? The state solicitor general pausing before saying... I don't know the answer. Signed last December by Governor Greg Abbott, SB4 would allow state authorities to arrest migrants suspected of crossing illegally and even empower state judges to order deportations back to Mexico. Texas leaders calling the law a direct result of the federal government failing to stop prior record numbers of migrants from crossing the southern border. Sheriff Ramundo Del Bosque from Zapata County supports the new law. What we're targeting is the, the, the violence, the cartel, people that want to, violent offenders that want to come across, not just from Mexico, but from different countries. But in Maverick County, 
Sheriff Tom Schmerber says he needs more information about how his department would enforce it. Are you equipped at this moment to put this law into practice? No, I think I think we need, we need more time. Schmerber adding the legal back and forth do little to help border communities like his. Do you feel like a pawn in a big political game? That's the way I feel. I'm pretty sure the other sheriffs from the border are thinking the same way. And this morning, we are hearing yet again from the country of Mexico. Over the last 24 hours, their president calling SB4 draconian and dehumanizing, emphasizing they would not accept any migrants from the state of Texas. And as for the legal path forward here uh, for this controversial law, we know this same panel of three judges will hear oral arguments again on April 3rd over the constitutionality of the law. But legal experts say, considering their response to the arguments yesterday, the law's legal future is uncertain at best. We'll send it back to you. All right, Morgan, thank you. Now to the legal trouble surrounding former President Donald Trump. His lawyers say they have been unsuccessful at securing a bond to cover the $464 million judgment in his New York civil fraud case. The state could potentially seize Mr. Trump's assets, possibly including Trump Tower, if he can't make bond by next Monday's deadline. This comes as his general election opponent, President Biden, hits the campaign trail this week. NBC's Garrett Haig joins us from Washington with the latest. Garrett, good morning. Hey, Joe. Good morning. Yeah, Mr. Trump has tried to use his current cash crunch as a catalyst for his campaign, asking donors to chip in to help him fight back against a case that he's always cast as political, which now threatens the core of his political identity, his wealth. Facing a Monday deadline to post a nearly half-billion-dollar bond in the civil fraud case against him, former President Donald Trump is short on cash and running out of time. His attorney's emergency appeal filing still unanswered by the judge. The billionaire developer could have to sell off prized assets to cover the costs or risk seeing them seized by the state. You can't reverse selling off Trump Tower on a fire sale at a discounted price. The former president has raged about the judges and Democratic Attorney General Letitia James's handling of his case on social media. On Wednesday, writing, this case should be over, but instead the attorney general wants to abuse her power to steal my money. Mr. Trump owes $454 million of the total $464 million judgment, but with an annual interest rate of 9%, that amount increases by $111,000 every day it goes unpaid. We have a lot of cash and we have a great company, but they want to take it away. At Mar-a-Lago, campaign sources tell NBC News of concern and frustration, but not panic, among Mr. Trump's inner circle about the approaching deadline. Trump allies have even asked some political donors about guaranteeing his bond, according to a person involved in those discussions. In another sign that the former president's legal issues are translating into financial headaches, new campaign fundraising numbers show him trailing Team Biden by nearly $40 million. Meanwhile, President Biden in battleground Arizona is pointing to progress on the economy, awarding $8.5 billion in grants to Intel for semiconductor production in the U.S. I want to build a future in America. My predecessor is going to let the future be built in China and other countries. With independent candidate Robert F. Kennedy Jr. looming as a possible spoiler to the president's re-election effort and polling at 13 percent, according to a recent Fox News poll. Sources close to the Kennedys say family members who oppose RFK Jr.'s bid are set to step up their efforts to boost Mr. Biden. Just days after dozens of Kennedys gathered with the president in the White House Rose Garden on St. Patrick's Day. Now, asked about that gathering, a senior member of the Kennedy family tells NBC News, quote, there was a point of having everybody there. The Biden team reportedly happy to let the Kennedys take the lead on helping out his campaign, then working to support them as needed. Joe. All right, Garrett, thank you. It is time now for weather, and much of the country is in for a rainy end to the work week. Meteorologist Angie Lastman is tracking what's in store today and for the weekend. Angie, good morning. Good morning, guys. It's not all bad news when it comes to the weekend forecast. We'll get to the good news, too, but first we got to talk about some snow and some rain that, yes, is going to be impacting much of the country here as we go through the next couple of days. A little bit of snow falling in parts of the upper Midwest, the north northern parts of the plains today, and we've got some still lingering across parts of New England. 15 million people included in those alerts this morning. Those some of 
of them at least, will likely continue over the next couple of days. We've got this storm system to blame for the snow. That's what's bringing the northern plains that kind of fresh uh, batch of snow through the day today. We also have some showers and some thunderstorm activity that we're going to watch across parts of the southern plains today and across parts of the Gulf Coast. And eventually, as we get into tomorrow, kind of a mess of a forecast when it comes to rain uh, across the parts of the southeast. It's going to be a soggy one. We'll likely see slower travel on the roads and in the air. Uh, this will be something you'll watch into parts of your Sunday or parts of your Saturday rather as well. There's the snow we're going to watch work across parts of the Great Lakes for your Friday and then eventually move into parts of northern New England. We'll see some heavy snow at times uh, and potentially up to a foot of it in some spots of northern New England by the time the weekend wraps up. But notice this heavy rain we're also going to be tracking. It'll be closer to the coast, but still it'll be uh, something that you'll have to watch for for flooding concerns over the next couple of days. And here's why some impressive rainfall amounts, especially parts of southern Florida, picking up potentially five to six inches of rain in some of those spots doesn't take much for it to flood there. So we'll be watching that closely over the next couple of days. Uh, Mid-Atlantic Northeast included in this as well with up to four inches possible. I think the more likely numbers two to three inches, but still the flooding will be something that we have to watch for. Meanwhile, temperatures, I know what you're thinking, where is spring? Well, not here in Cleveland because we're only heading 33 degrees for your high today. We've got 30s on tap for Chicago too, barely into the 40s in New York. And this continues into tomorrow too, especially for the northern tier of the country. Those areas that I mentioned are going to that are going to see uh, the, the the snowfall in the next couple of days. As far as your spring is concerned, already looking at one of the top three warmest marches on record for much of this area. We've got parts of the northeast and the Midwest that are seeing their first leaves up to three weeks early. Notice places like New York two weeks early, uh, up to a week early in some spots across parts of the southeast. Des Moines about 20 days early. We've got Detroit 23 days early. So really impressive kind of start to spring. And of course, and we've talked a lot about those cherry blossoms in bloom um, in Washington, D.C. already reaching peak. Now, what does this mean for your pollen report? Wah, wah, let's talk about it. We've got uh, a high pollen expected for parts of the southeast today. Of course, the southwest included in that as well. I think the best news I can give to the people that are dealing with the snow guys, low pollen for today. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> no surprise there. No allergies while yeah, you're yeah. shoveling. But you might be sneezing in the southeast today. Oof, I've been sneezing here, too. I have, too. I know. Listen, that's what happens when you got a warm march. There you go. Angie Lassman, thank you. Of course. Now to an investigation involving Los Angeles Dodgers star Shohei Otani's longtime interpreter. The team announced it has fired Ipe Mitahara following questions surrounding $4.5 million in wire transfers sent from Otani's bank account to a sports bookmaker that's under federal investigation. NBC News correspondent Liz Kreutz joins us with the latest on this. Liz, good morning. Hey, Joe, good morning. Yeah, Shohei Otani has arguably become the face of Major League Baseball, signing that massive $700 million contract with the Dodgers. And nearly everywhere he goes, his longtime Japanese interpreter, Ipe Misuhara, is right there beside him. But the Dodgers have now abruptly fired that interpreter after a report he used Otani's money to pay off gambling debts. This morning, serious questions swirling around baseball superstar Shohei Otani and his longtime interpreter. After the Los Angeles Dodgers fired his interpreter, Ipe Mizuhara, after being accused by Otani's attorneys of massive theft, reportedly tied to millions of dollars in gambling debt. Overnight, the Dodgers confirming the team terminated the interpreter and has no further comment. Otani's lawyers made the bombshell accusation after the L.A. Times reported his name was tied to a federal investigation into a multi-million dollar sports gambling scheme in California, where sports betting is illegal. Ms. Uhara told ESPN he placed bets on international soccer matches and other sports, but not baseball starting in 2021. The interpreter also told the outlet that he asked Otani last year to pay off his gambling debt, which the network reported had skyrocketed to at least $4.5 million. He said Otani had zero involvement in the betting. According to ESPN, wire transfers were sent from Otani's account. A day after his initial interview with ESPN, Ms. Uhara changed his account of what happened and told the network that Otani had no knowledge of his debts and had not made the payments. Attorneys for Shohei Otani releasing a statement saying, in the course of responding to recent media inquiries, we discover that Shohei has been the victim of a massive theft and we are turning the matter over to the authorities. 
This comes as the Dodgers are in South Korea for a world tour and recently suffered a scare after a bomb threat with no explosive devices found. It's shocking news for a player who has become a global superstar, winning two American League MVP awards, many calling him the best pitcher hitter player since Babe Ruth. The 29-year-old signing a record-breaking blockbuster 10-year, $700 million contract with the Dodgers this past offseason. Now this controversy threatening to cast a shadow over one of baseball's brightest new stars. Now, NBC News has not independently verified the details of those ESPN and L.A. Times reports. Otani is not currently facing any discipline from the MLB, but this has certainly shocked Dodgers fans. Otani's interpreter was with the baseball superstar even yesterday at that game in Seoul, South Korea. He was terminated at some point after that. Joe and Savannah. All right, Liz, thank you. There is more to come on this hour of morning news now, including the alleged royal data breach involving Princess Kate's sensitive medical records. But first, after the break, the massive manhunt that's underway for an escaped inmate in Idaho who police say pulled off a daring and violent prison break that left three corrections officers injured. More on that next. Welcome back. A manhunt is underway for a dangerous inmate in Boise, Idaho, following a daring escape that left several corrections officers injured. NBC News correspondent Dana Griffin joins us with the latest on this. Dana, good morning. Joe, good morning. As the hours tick by, authorities are in an all-out search for these two men after they carried out the surprise attack. And there's no indication of where they are or where they're headed. Police now warning they are considered armed and dangerous and have shown they're willing to use extreme violence. This morning, 31-year-old inmate Skylar Mead is on the run after authorities say he pulled off a sophisticated prison break that left three corrections officers injured. We believe that this was a coordinated attack, an ambush on the Department of Corrections officers and uh, certainly a planned endeavor to free him from custody. Mead, shown here, handcuffed and bloodied, was taken to the hospital hours earlier for self-inflicted injuries. Then, just as he was about to be returned to prison, police say an alleged accomplice showed up at St. Alphonse's Regional Medical Center in Boise and opened fire, shooting two officers. A third officer injured in the crossfire. Overnight, investigators identifying the alleged accomplice as Nicholas Umfenauer. Authorities say Meade and Umfenauer fled in this gray Honda Civic. Uh, they are dangerous, they are armed, and they have shown a propensity for violence. Meade has a lengthy rap sheet and had been in prison for nearly eight years for shooting at a deputy during a 2016 high-speed chase. He was eligible for parole in 2026. Investigators also revealing he is a member of a white supremacist gang. They could be anywhere at this point. We're following every lead and uh, accepting every possibility. Thankfully, all three officers are expected to survive. The FBI is now involved in the manhunt, and authorities are urging anyone who spots the suspects to not approach, but to immediately call 911. Joe? All right, Dana, thank you. Now let's get to the ongoing unrest in Haiti. U.S. chartered helicopters have begun flying Americans out of the capital city as gang violence continues to run rampant. Nearly 1,600 U.S. citizens have registered with the State Department seeking more information about leaving Haiti. A flight chartered by Florida's Department of Emergency Management carrying evacuated Floridians arrived in Orlando from Haiti on Wednesday. For more on this, we are now joined by the former U.S. Special Envoy to Haiti, Daniel Foote. Good morning. Thank you so much for being here with us to discuss this. So let's start on these evacuations that we are starting to see get underway. Walk us through the challenges associated with getting people out of a situation like this and back here into America. So it's an enormous challenge. Unlike the earthquake in 2010 when we evacuated 15,000 mm. people, we can't get into the airport. The mm. gangs control the airport right now. So the U.S. is currently contracting with airlift companies to try to get people out via Cap Haitien, which is the second biggest city in the north. Very difficult to get there over land. And I have air companies calling me to ask if how we can help secure landing zones in Port-au-Prince, which makes me very nervous right now. Mm. We discussed last week how you were critical of putting the Prime Minister Ariel Henry in the position in the first place. Now he's promised to step down once this transitional council is in place. How is that transition realistically going to work? Will the gangs be involved, do you think, in that process? 
The gangs are sending a clear signal that they don't want this transition. They don't want the international community naming another leader of Haiti again here. And perversely, they're kind of echoing the people's sentiment here. The U.S. and the international community is choosing eight Haitians who will then name the next, choose and name the next government, and saying that it's Haitian-led. That's not Haitian-led. The Haitians are not going to fall for that. So armed gangs, we understand, launched new attacks yesterday in Port-au-Prince. As you mentioned, it's gotten to the point even where they're controlling the airport, blocking off certain parts of the city. What can be done? What should be done? When can something be done to get something like this under control? Uh, given the history of international intervention in Haiti, intervening without some sort of political foundation, without some sort of trustworthy partner mm -hmm. that sort of represents the Haitian people is a disaster waiting to happen. You could send in peacekeepers who wind up fighting the very people that they're sent to protect in Haiti because they could be seen as propping up another illegitimate regime. What do you think is the answer here? What would you like to see? A Haitian-led national dialogue in which they will come up with a consensus political agreement, which we had two years ago and was yeah. ignored, and then the international community supports them with security resources and development resources to move Haiti towards eventual elections, but they have to be acceptable by the Haitian people. Daniel Foote, important conversation. Thank you very much for being here. Thanks for having me. More international news now. The U.S. has just submitted a draft resolution to the U.N. calling for a ceasefire in Gaza. NBC international correspondent Josh Letterman joins us on this. Hey, Josh, good morning. Hey, good morning, Savannah. Secretary of State Antony Blinken says the U.N. has introduced that resolution at the Security Council calling for an immediate ceasefire that is tied to a deal to free Israeli hostages. Now, this is a shift for the Biden administration, which previously vetoed three different U.N. resolutions calling for a ceasefire. But the U.S. and Israel are now openly at odds over the IDF's planned incursion into Rafah, with the U.S. warning huge numbers of civilians could be killed. And back here in the UK, Prime Minister Rishi Sunak's plan to send unauthorized asylum seekers to Rwanda has hit yet another setback. The House of Lords declined to pass the bill as is and wants changes which will likely delay it yet again. Sunak says deporting migrants by plane is the only way to stop asylum seekers from arriving in the UK on small boats. But human rights advocates say Rwanda is not a safe place to send them. And finally, let's go to Poland, where a roughly 200-year-old tree has won this year's European Tree of the Year. The sprawling tree named the Heart of the Garden is the third Polish tree in a row to win that contest. The runner-up went to a tree in Normandy, France, nicknamed Weeping Beach, which is more than 130 feet wide, and it needs its own structure to keep it supported and upright. Guys, wow. congrats Beautiful. to those trees. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Josh, thank you so much. <laughs> there are new developments this morning in the controversy surrounding Princess Kate. Staffers at the London Clinic where Kate was treated for that abdominal surgery are now reportedly under investigation for an alleged breach of her medical records. NBC News international correspondent Molly Hunter joins us now from Buckingham Palace with the latest on this. Molly, good morning. Savannah, good morning to you. That's right. The allegations are growing. And today there are reports that three staffers at the London Clinic are behind that alleged data breach. This morning, the allegations of a royal data breach growing. Multiple UK news outlets, including The Mirror, which broke the story, report three staff members at the London Clinic where Kate underwent surgery back in January could be investigated and potentially face disciplinary action for allegedly trying to access the princess's personal medical information. NBC News has not confirmed this reporting. I understand that their three staff uh, at the London Clinic are, have been suspended on allegations that they accessed or tried to access the Prince's private medical data. And we don't know whether that was paper records or via a computer system. The UK government privacy watchdog confirmed to NBC News they received a breach report and are still assessing information, but didn't share whether it included one or more allegations. Well, I think we must remember at the centre of this saga is a woman who has undergone a very serious operation. The fact that the Princess of Wales has been caught up will only add to the distress that she's uh, been feeling over the last few weeks. Kensington Palace not confirming whether or not Kate has been notified, referring all questions to the London Clinic. In a statement, the hospital said, in the case of any breach, all appropriate investigatory, regulatory and disciplinary steps will be taken, adding there's no place at our hospital for those who intentionally breach the trust of any of our patients or colleagues. 
The London Clinic has long been a discreet option for members of the royal family and celebrities flying under the radar, reportedly even JFK and Liz Taylor. The late Queen Elizabeth and Prince Philip both received treatment there, as did King Charles back in January. The two senior royals carrying the load continuing on in the face of the swirling headlines. Prince William all smiles, making a visit to the Welsh Guards near Windsor, speaking with soldiers and focusing on physical and mental rehab, while Queen Camilla stepping in for the king. But he's certainly here, armed with a copy of his speech. And referencing Caden Williams' youngest, known for his antics. I guess, I mean, I I Yes. <laughs> Sweet little look right there uh, of Camilla as a grandmother. Now, as far as what's next in the investigation, Savannah, any investigation would look at method and timing. So on timing, you just heard from the Mirror reporter in that piece who broke the story. And according to his reporting, all of this happened after Kate was discharged from the hospital in January. As far as method, was it computer or was it paper records? They would be, of course, looking at that very, very mm. closely. Savannah. All right, Molly Hunter, thank you for your continued reporting on this. Coming up, a social media post by elusive fitness guru Richard Simmons is causing some concern among fans this morning. After the break, the emotional message she's now walking back. That's next on Morning News Now. Welcome back. Alabama is now the latest state to enact a ban on diversity, equity, and inclusion programs in public universities and government agencies. NBC News senior legal correspondent Laura Jarrett has the details, including how students are responding to the move. The governor of Alabama signing a new law banning all diversity programs across the state's public universities and government agencies. SB 129 has passed. It passed with overwhelming Republican support, but likely to face legal headwinds soon for its broad sweep. As of October 1st, any program that involves a, quote, divisive concept cannot receive state funding. Republican Governor Kay Ivey saying, I refuse to allow a few bad actors on college campuses, or wherever else for that matter, to go under the acronym of DEI using taxpayer funds to push their liberal political movement. The law coming after days of debate in the state legislature. Everybody in this room is created equal, and so I thank you for bringing this now that we have can no longer taxpayer money and go to programs that teach us that we are actually different. But civil rights advocates arguing it tramples on the constitutional rights of students and faculty. When you have a bill like this and it's incredibly vague, um, folks get scared. This is going to have a direct impact on DEI offices across the state. Alabama only the latest in a line of states taking sharp aim at diversity programs. Florida's Stop Woke Act preventing companies from requiring diversity trainings now tied up in legal challenges. But back in Montgomery, students have been making their voices heard all month. DEI has never made me feel threatened, hurt. Alabama schools now trying to sort through the implications of how to comply with this new law and still teach. Laura Jarrett, NBC News. Well, fitness personality Richard Simmons says he's been diagnosed with skin cancer. That announcement comes just days after Simmons sparked concern with an emotional post telling fans he was dying. NBC News entertainment correspondent Chloe Malas has more on his condition. Hey there, Richard Simmons, who hasn't been seen publicly since 2014, says that he underwent a successful procedure to remove skin cancer. But his recent posts about his health have fans concerned. In a series of lengthy social media posts, 75-year-old fitness guru Richard Simmons telling fans he had skin cancer. The former workout star describing the moment he went to the doctor and was diagnosed. I asked him what kind of cancer, and he said basal cell carcinoma. I told him to stop calling me dirty names. He laughed. Simmons says he underwent minor surgery to remove the cancer under his eye. And although the procedure hurt, he writes, my cancer was nothing compared to some people that I knew. In a follow-up post, Simmons says the incident took place years ago. So why post now? Simmons says, the reason I wrote these two messages is that if you see a spot on your body, please go to your doctor so they can diagnose it right away. Simmons' skin cancer revelation comes just two days after this alarming post on social media. I have some news to tell you. Please don't be sad. 
I am dying. Hours later, Simmons clarifying his comments, saying he wasn't in fact dying, but rather was trying to be inspirational. Sorry many of you have gotten upset about my message today. I am not dying. It was a message about saying how we should embrace every day that we have. Sorry for this confusion. Love, Richard. I don't sense anything erratic about him. They're actually Seth Abramovich of The Hollywood and, uh, Reporter says he exchanged emails with Simmons after his posts. He told me he, most of his days are spent uh, responding to the comments on his posts and that he's loving it. You got it. We're going to stick up those calories. Simmons, known for his over-the-top personality and entertaining workouts, has not been seen publicly in over a decade, making him the focus of conspiracy theories and even a popular podcast in 2014, Missing Richard Simmons. I'm trying to find out what happened to Richard. And one, two, three, four. Speculation about his seclusion prompting Simmons to call into the Today Show in 2016 to debunk reports that he was being held hostage by his longtime housekeeper. No one is holding me in my house as a hostage. You know, I do what I want to do as I've always done. So people should sort of just believe what I have to say because, like, I'm Richard Simmons. Because I just love myself, every part of myself. And I think I can show you how to get here. Simmons also recently making headlines, slamming a movie about his life, starring comedian Polly Shore, saying he did not authorize the project. And round and round. Now these latest posts only fueling speculation about how Simmons is really doing. When reached by NBC News, Simmons and his representatives declined to do an interview. For now, fans will just have to follow along his almost weekly social media posts for updates. Back to you. All right, Chloe, thank you so much. Coming up, a decades-old beverage battle is positively popping off this morning. After the break, why Subway is now canning Coke products and partnering with Pepsi instead, serving up a new era of the Pepsi Challenge. We've got the bubbling details on this rekindled refreshment rivalry. <laughs> We're back now with a look at the long-running war between bubbly juggernauts Coke and Pepsi. For years, the two have battled it out for the hearts of the nation. And now the sandwich chain Subway is shaking things up, announcing they're ditching their Coke products for Pepsi. NBC News correspondent Emily Aketa has the details. Hey there, well, like it or not, for the next 10 years, Subway customers will get a Pepsi with their footlong subs. The head-turning shift in drink providers is reigniting a decades-long battle in the beverages industry, and consumers have a lot to say about it. This morning, an age-old rivalry is popping off again. With a head-turning announcement from Subway that after nearly two decades, it's swapping out Coca-Cola products for Pepsi starting next year. Writing in a statement, its new partnership brings fresh energy to our beverage selections and better value and choice for our franchisees. Try Subway's Tasty Tuna today. And while Subway customers will soon get Pepsi with their footlongs, in Ohio, restaurant chains Skyline and Gold Star revealed a switch to Coke. I don't know who needs to hear this, but Coca-Cola tastes way better than Pepsi. And the latest saga in the soda wars has consumers talking. I'm choosing Pepsi every time. The battle between Coca-Cola and Pepsi and their fridge full of popular products has been bubbling up for decades. When two titans go head to head. Playing out in documentaries, on social media, and of course, advertisements. You're the best generation. Pepsi tapping into star power. While Coca-Cola tugs on heartstrings. What's it say? The last time a large chain switched beverage providers was Arby's in 2018. But experts say Subway's move to source both snacks and drinks from PepsiCo is likely a cost-saving measure. What makes it somewhat of a big deal is it's one of the largest quick service restaurants uh, that is switching back. The beverage industry is growing more complicated and competitive. This soda has none of the bad stuff. CDC research shows increasingly health-conscious consumers are drinking less soda in recent years and seeking out global flavors that can be smoky, tangy, even spicy. The drink on the go has definitely changed the overall brand portfolio that both companies have. The clash of colas ramping up as they try to prevent business from going flat. 
And Coca-Cola tells us the company has proudly served Subway restaurants in the U.S. and is staying focused on delivering value through the end of the year. And the Cola Wars, by the way, could soon be on the big screen, too, with reports saying Sony has spent a million dollars on a movie script about the long-running industry feud. Back to you. All right, Emily, thank you. Now let's get to what is making financial headlines. Let's start with some new employment numbers out just this morning. CNBC Savannah now has that and other money news. Savannah, good morning. Joe, Savannah, good morning to you. Yeah, and with the stock market at record highs, we're getting the latest snapshot on the economy with jobless claims down 2,000 to 210,000 last week. Economists were expecting 213,000, just goes to show the continued strength in the labor market. All right, Threads is copying a feature from dating apps like Match and Tinder. Users can now swipe left on posts they don't like and right on posts that they do. Meta CEO Mark Zuckerberg announcing the feature yesterday. For now, it's only being rolled out to a limited number of users. And a classic cookie is getting a makeover. Chips Ahoy is debuting a new recipe for its original cookie. It will look and feel the same, but with an updated taste featuring chocolate chips with a higher cocoa and vanilla extract content. It's the biggest innovation to the Chips Ahoy cookie in a decade. The new version is available in select stores this week and nationwide starting in April. That was my favorite cookie growing up. I was all in the camp of chunky chips ahoy oh yeah i'm always just like the original <laughs> that was my absolute favorite and dipping them in yeah i do think it's pretty milk. good though oh, for like a packaged so cookie so i wonder yeah. how they made it better i like how they say it's going to look the same like it's, and, it's not going to look like a look look same, you know? look <laughs> <and feel. laughs> yeah. thanks so much thanks so yeah. much well while space enthusiasts are preparing to see the upcoming total solar eclipse some with vision loss are making alternate plans as eric had cost from our nbc news affiliate in rochester new york tells us one woman who once dreamed of being an astronomer now plans to help others hear the phenomenon instead. This would be more like, you know, 207 as we move toward 320. Kiki Smith has been educating herself for the past several months. Rochester has this top dot here. Here, she's using her fingertips to learn. But come April 8th, she'll be using her ears. Kiki lost her eyesight over time, stemming from a diagnosis in second grade. Her condition, uveitis, tearing down the tissue in her eye wall over the course of her lifetime. Degenerative, I prefer to explain. Not a death sentence, she says, but childhood dreams of becoming an astronomer seemed out of the picture. That high pitch is a lot of... It's hard to do this when you're blind. That's the sonar technology she plans on using to hear the eclipse in real time. Smith will be sharing this with others as part of an accessibility event at Genesee Valley Park next month. A party she's helping to host along with other community organizers. The technology, exactly what it sounds like. As it gets darker, incrementally by the minute, those tones will decrease. Now that brief moment of darkness is something Kiki's been preparing for all year. She recalls feeling left out during the partial eclipse in 2017. As everybody else was talking about what they were seeing and all the places they were going with their friends. But now she's sharing with others who may have also felt left out. Living her dream of bringing inclusivity and empowerment to the neighborhood. I'm really step back and realize how little we are in the grand scheme of things and how each of the folks that we bring into our days matter just as much. Wow, how incredible is that? Our thanks to reporter Erica DeCoste from our NBC News affiliate in Rochester for that report. Well, coming up, we are celebrating Broadway's best and brightest this morning with the latest installment of our original series, Curtain Call. After the break, we've got a front row seat to Aladdin 10 years after its debut on The Great White Way. And what better way to celebrate than chatting with Michael James Scott, the genie Ooh. himself, joins us next right here on Morning News Now. <laughs> Welcome back and Swifties, the Taylor takeover continues. It was just announced that the Eras Tour movie broke a Disney Plus record to become the number one most streamed music film ever on the platform. In fact, Disney says the film got 4.6 million views on Disney Plus in the first three days of its release just last week. And over the past weekend, it racked up more than 16.2 million viewing hours, according to the company. 
Are we really surprised, though? I mean, we know all too well that it is just her reputation to break records. But, I mean, the real breaking news here is going to be when Joe watches it. I haven't watched it yet, but I did have a friend who had never, wasn't a huge Taylor fan, say they watched it over the weekend and did enjoy it. So, <laughs> there you go. Well, that's an understatement. There yes, <laughs> Joe, we're going to have to get you on it next. And then all you right. can hopefully give us a more glowing review than all that. All right. Sounds good. All right. Let's keep the Disney theme going here and end this hour with a curtain call. Your front row ticket to some of the hottest shows on Broadway and beyond. This morning, we're going to take you on a magic carpet ride with a Disney classic. We are talking, of course, about Aladdin. Yesterday marked 10 years of the show's Broadway run. Now, 10 years later, the cast is still bringing fans to a whole new world. And we are lucky to have Michael James Scott here, who, of course, plays the beloved genie in the Aladdin Broadway show. Congratulations. Good to have you with us. Thank do, you. Do your friends ask you for wishes all the time? <laughs> yes. Friends, <laughs> people on the street, you know, the bodega man, like everyone. They all ask for wishes. And you grant them all, right? <laughs> Every last one of them. <laughs> <laughs> so yesterday was the official 10-year, according to the date. Could the audience tell? Could you feel something a little different during the show? Sure. I mean, we you know we do this amazing energy circle before, and we talked about we had an ama- we had a big group of young students at our matinee yesterday, which is so cool because a lot of them this was their first Broadway show, so it was a reminder of that. You know, they didn't know that that was the actual 10-year anniversary, but we knew, and so that was just an incredible way to just kind of like. Get, you know, get that remembrance of like what it is that we do, why it's so special, the feeling, the audience, the energy, all of that, and also the families that were there just experiencing. They probably were like, wow, this cast is re- they, we, they <laughs> really going, going on here. here. Wow. Like, what is happening? But <laughs> it, the energy is so electrifying always that it, it feels really fun. But yesterday was always, it was extra special because we hit 10 years. Exactly. Just a little bit extra there. You've been with the show since the beginning. I mean, why do you think Broadway is a tough business? There are some really good shows that only last a few months sometimes. Even a Disney show is not guaranteed to necessarily go on and on. What is it about this show that you think has made it last so long? Well, I mean, it's such an honor to be in the group of only 14 other Broadway shows in history to make it to this milestone. Um, for us, it is, I, I, I think it's the joy, the joy of Aladdin and what it brings. The love, the light, the laughter is such an amazing thing for people that they want that. But our heart of our story is the joy. It keeps people coming. Everybody can come. Your whole family can come, which is such a beautiful thing. Uh, it's also something that worldwide, it's, it's some people, they love it. They mm-hmm. just love it. So to me, it's the joy. You just you just keep coming back. You want you, we all want joy in our life, right? We yeah. all want that that thing that makes us uh, excited about being a part of something that we know is special. And I think Aladdin does that. In ten years, has anything changed about it, or have you seen anything sort of transform as the show has moved along? Oh gosh, probably the biggest change has been the cast coming in and out, the crew coming in. You know, yeah. like, oh, the show is the show, and it has been that's what's so incredible. Once we set our show and our incredible creative team put that you know final stamp on it, the show just like exploded into the world, right? Of like just joyful explosion, and so. All the changes have been all the other actors and all the other, uh, you know, uh, stage managers and crew members and and all the behind the scenes people who have come in and out of the show Mm -hmm. uh, and bring their life into it. But the show has been has been its beautiful, brilliant self since we finally opened. You played the genie all over the world. Of course, there was the OG, the original genie, Robin Williams. Yes, uh, yes, yes. How, how do you honor what they've done, which is what people know, but also bring yourself in? You pray course. really hard. <laughs> <laughs> no, it is. Oh, my gosh. Well, you know, it's so interesting and such a, like, a big thing to, to take on the genie. Someone's like, you're going to be the genie. Go. You know, like, what's going on? Let me see you. You know, you're like, ah! It's it's but what's been amazing is, you know, the imprint that, of course, Robin Williams, the late, great, brilliant Robin Williams had will always have its imprint on it. But the creative team said, Michael James Scott, we want you to put your thing onto Mm -hmm. it. So when you get when you get that 
amazing comfort in that sort of like approval from a creative team that allows you and trusts you to do your thing. It's really exciting and also challenging, right? To figure out what you want to do. But for me, it's been about the authenticity of really just being unapologetically Michael James Scott in this role. So I'm bringing my Beyonce, I'm bringing my grandfather, <laughs> I'm bringing my preacher, I'm bringing all of it. I'm bringing the bodega man. Like I'm bringing everybody in there into this role because the genie is everyone. And that's what's so great about the show that people see so much of themselves in all of our show. We our show is filled with every kind of color, shape, size, all right, on the stage. And so, and then you add the genie in there, and it's just like, wow, there's just so much going on. So Ooh. I think that that's probably what what makes it special and 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 make it for me to be able to do me. We have a lot, we only have like 30 seconds here, but you mentioned how many times this is a young person's first Broadway show. Yes. You think about the fact that there are people who 10 years ago, it was their first show, and now perhaps they're performing on Broadway. They were inspired by that. Oh, yes. I mean, I, 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 our princess, gorgeous Princess Jasmine, Sonia, uh, she was she she was saying, she was like, <laughs> I loved I, she, another Broadway show that I'd seen. She had like braces and me and her at the stage door, and now she's playing, you know, the iconic Princess Jasmine. And so she grew up with it, watching, seeing the show as a child mm -hmm. on the stage. And now she's playing Princess Jasmine. It's a beautiful, beautiful story. And we have that that happens in our show often. And it's 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 amazing to sit there watch. Now, I'm, I just, so I don't So wishes come true is what you're saying. Yes, yes, exactly. Yes. Wishes come true. Yes, come on, thank Joe. You. Michael James Scott, thank you so much for coming on. Congratulations on 10 years. Thank you. Thank you for having me in my dressing room. Thank you. <laughs> that is going to do it for this hour of morning news now. Well, fun is that. The news continues right now. Stay with us. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.